really, really delighted to have Anoop Menon uh, present this next, next presentation, which is Architectural Spaces with Glass, Light and Shade. And, you know, we think it's um, just a really sort of fitting conclusion to sort of draw right back and, and have an exploration and, and perhaps gain a bit of understanding about uh, um, large public spaces. There was about 12 of us that had the, the great fortune to um, go on a tour of the Samri Building, which is the South Australian Hospital and Medical Research Institute, fairly new building that opened up about 12 months ago on North Terrace, and some of you would have seen it. And uh, we think it's just an amazing example of um, new architecture, you know, an incredible sort of splash on the, the urban landscape here in Adelaide. Um, an exciting counterpoint and um, to, to other spaces around. And, um, and when we went on the tour, I guess I think, I'm sure I can speak for some of the others too, I think when you go into some of those amazing large buildings, you know, you, you reflect on that sort of cathedral-like space and, and what going into a, a grand space and a very thoughtful space, what, what that gives you as a, as, a, as a member of the public, you know. So really delighted to have um, Anoop here today. He's the senior associate from Woods Backett um, in the Adelaide studio here. And he's had over 20 years experience in architecture and urban design projects. Would you please welcome Anoop Menon. Thanks, Claire. So the building we are about to start on this uh, presentation is about the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. Now, that this is a project that is very close to the, our hearts. We've been uh, involved uh, with SAMRI for the last five years. We started this journey with SAMRI, uh, and one of the key questions we asked ourselves was, can creative architecture and functional lab design coexist. So just a bit of background before we get onto the building. The, the, the brief that we got from the client uh, was uh, it, had to be, it had to house 675 research staff. It had to have eight research uh, laboratory modules, and all of them had to be 100% wet lab enabled. It had to have a public space or a plaza. And of course, in terms of program, it had to have the vivarium, the research modules, a cyclotron facility, and infrastructure. Uh, a little bit of numbers in terms of uh, the area had to be around 25,000 square meters. And the cost for this project was 200 million, which was part of the federal funding as part, uh, as part of the economic stimulus uh, you know, five years ago. As most of you are aware, this is uh, located just next to the new Royal Adelaide Hospital. And uh, one of the key things that we were given right at the beginning was the vision from SAMRI. So in terms of the, the, the brief that we had, the vision became the sort of key sort of document we went back to during the five years at every decision uh, making. And some of the items that we sort of picked up from that was things like uh, it had to foster col collaboration and c connectedness. And looking at that, I think one of the key things that we had to keep in mind was the, the aspiration of SAMRI. SAMRI wanted this to be the headquarters for the institute and not just the institute because this was essentially going to be the, the hub for all research happening all around South Australia. One of the other things was that the, the aspiration was to have a thing of the world in Adelaide. And keeping all of these in mind, I think glass was one of the key elements that we looked at as, as an element that would give not only the enclosure, but also internally divide spaces so that you could have that connectedness, you could have that collaboration, and at the same time, take it to that next level where translational research could happen when people actually look into the building. And one of the key things that they wanted to actually foster was that this building was meant to inspire young students. So when you walk down the streets and look into the building, the whole, whole aspiration for SAMRI was that young minds would actually get inspired to do research and get into science. So with, with these uh, brief, we started looking at the whole building. Uh, we first took a step back in terms of the urban context. Now, as most of you are aware of the, the North Terrace Boulevard, there is the precinct, there is the university precinct, the cultural precinct, the entertainment precinct, and SAMRI was going to be located in the newly formed uh, health and medical research precinct. Now, 
this was a, a site that was uh, formerly a, a rail yard, and so we were the first building coming off the ranks out in, in that zone. So we are very conscious of the fact that the site would be a catalyst for revitalizing that section of the city. At the same time, it had to acknowledge its place by looking at the, at, at the city as well as the parklands next to it. So the design response from our side was that the site basically had to house these two uh, simple lab modules of 1,000 square meters. And at that time, when we started this process five years ago, we didn't have the new Royal Adelaide Hospital next to us. So the whole idea was that we had to acknowledge that there would be a design that would foster that sort of collaboration and people sort of using that sort of public space. So we rotated the lab modules, and that provided a forecourt right at the entrance. So that sort of addressed the, 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 the tie-in with the public plaza on the, onto the uh, Royal Adelaide Hospital. At the same time, it, it sort of focused onto the, the, the North Terrace Boulevard. That allowed us to create uh, the central atria in the middle, and that central atria became the arrival hub. At the same time, on the in, inner side, it became the collaborative hub. And acknowledging the fact that the, the site used to be part of the parklands, we lifted the whole building up so that the building actually sits lightly onto the ground. And that allowed an interactive public domain on the ground level, which would, in, in the future, when the hospital comes up, become, becomes a larger public plaza space. The, the envelope that sort of covered the whole space were, had to be not only environmentally sustainable, at the same time create a unique form. And keeping, again, all of these in mind, it had to be connected to its context, i.e. The, the city as well as the, the parklands. Now, some of the, as I said, the vision was a key uh, brief that we were interested with to sort of take through the whole design process. And some of the things were being open and transparent, fostering collaboration, and having that knowledge sharing between different research groups, which would ultimately create those synergies in ideas and innovation. So in terms of a, 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 a wet lab module, this is just a quick uh, uh, sort of a summary of what the wet lab module stands for. There are three essential spaces within a lab module. One is the write-up area. So um, in terms of the, the blue, the light blue element in the in the front, uh, then there is the that is where that is the area that the researcher comes in first thing in the morning, sort of logs in, schedules his day, and then they go into the lab area, the lab benches area. Now the laboratories are places where the lab benches are generally kept onto one side so that the researcher can sort of you know work work in isolation. We looked at the whole model and thought that, that the, the whole idea of having this collaboration and having that flexibility meant that you needed to have the space which is a, a physical containment to certified space, but at the same time, you didn't, we didn't want to have the researcher sort of cut away from the rest of the things happening in the write-up area, or even missing out on daylights or views. So we placed the lab benches right in the middle, and on the western side, we placed all the support areas. Now, the support areas are areas that house things like the freezers, the, the fume cupboards, all the equipment that the researcher uses. And by placing, and by, by doing this whole passive design uh, exercise, we protected the building from the harsh western sun. So in terms of groupings, we, we're trying to sort of relate back to the, the siting of the building and, and in terms of the orientation that we had. So, so keeping all the write-up areas on to the east gave us that views and, and things that didn't really, in, in terms of getting as much of daylight in, into the spaces as possible. And after we arranged those three basic spaces, i.e. the write-up, the labs, and the support areas, the rest of the spaces fell into place so that we had the, the plant rooms on the, on the north and east uh, sort of noses of the building. The atriums on, on east and west became the sort of uh, cent uh, entrance hub as well as the collaborative hub, and then also having that vertical uh, continuity. The whole idea being that the researcher could go from one lab module to another and at the same time have that accidental sort of meeting with a, another colleague in that same building and start talking about the research, and, and the aim was that would sort of spur them to on, on to get, get some more inspiration in terms of collaboration and, and, and connected. And in terms of uh, the whole flexibility that Samri wanted, these spaces are basically being used currently as, as we sort of uh, thought about it. Uh, Samri, again, what you see above North Terrace, there are, there's a lot of program below it. Uh, Right on the on the ground or the, the lowest level is uh, is the cyclotron facility. Now that is the first uh, facility that is uh, uh, new to South Australia, and that is an area that produces radioisotopes to fight diseases, and uh, also the infrastructure that is needed for the building. 
And above that, we have a small vivarium on an animal facility and, and a few uh, interstitial spaces out there which help the research labs. Above the ground, ground plane is essentially, as we said, was the public space, and then the areas above that became the lab modules. Now, the, the building, as we said, the facade that sort of went around the building, the key things that we had to consider for the whole process, the design process, was A, is that the facade had to provide that consistent daylight. The, the views had to be enhanced. We had to limit the glare at the same time, reduce the energy getting into the building. At the same time, maintaining that unique form, which is a fairly non-conventional form and is fairly organic form. So we started by running the, the building through a series of uh, analysis. First was the daylight needs. We looked at the areas areas that required a lot of daylights, like the write-up areas. The, the support areas did not require a lot of light because they had equipment in them. Then we looked at the solar load that would be falling onto this uh, building. So the, the highest ones would be the ones that would be facing this, the, the heat in the extremes and then the mediums. And looking at all of those uh, daylight and the solar loads, we came up with the environmental controls. Now there are approximately 15,000 triangular glass panels, not glass, but panels all around the building. Some are glass, some are aluminum, some are just meshes. But the, the way we had to put that in, in place was to make sure that the glass areas were basically contained within those physically contained areas, at the same time give those daylight and uh, views at the same time. Uh, looking at, at uh, the, the repetitive form that we were looking for, we were looking for a singular skin that would actually envelop the whole building as an organic form. And again, getting inspired by nature, we ran our uh, analysis of the facade through a series of uh, analysis, looked at high performance glass to see if that would be the, the most uh, best solution into this uh, so system. We looked at ceramic frit, and we also looked at exterior shade. And running a multiple series of analysis of panel types, glare, uh, solar loads, daylight. The, the conclusion at the end was that the, uh, the shade was the best possible solution to, to meet all those solar gain uh, heat loads. Once we had all these uh, elements in place, we had to put it all together. And putting it all together in terms of an environmental, programmatic, and formal requirements, we had to put a lot of science into the design. So we ran the, the whole facade through a series of uh, programs. Uh, uh, looked at it in terms of geometry and set out, which was fairly complex because this was a fairly organic shape and not a very orthogonal uh, rectangular shape. We had to look at panelization because we could design anything, but it had to be fabricated and panelized so that you could bring it in and uh, erect it. Looked at it in terms of analysis and also in terms of rationalization to make sure that we sort of stuck within a certain parameter so that it could be easily uh, designed and fabricated. And running all of this uh, elements through the parametric modeling process, we basically came down from, say, a sunshades, which we had 300 different types of sunshades. We came down to about 20 types, which could be easily uh, you know, uh, fabricated and be, uh, have savings in, in terms of production. Um, again, as I said, we, when we, we worked very closely with the uh, facade engineers, Oricon, and also the contractor, which are Hindmarsh, and the facade subcontractors from Uanda, and working collaboratively as a, as a team, uh, again, going back to the vision that Samri gave us about the spaces being collaborative, we realized that we had to make sure that the design was done in a collaborative process so that everyone bought into the project in terms of the actual fabrication. So looking at it in terms of what, what's the best module to bring it in, what are the truck sizes coming in, and all those things made us run that whole analysis in terms of, again, the sunshades, which are the areas that need the sun, sunshade the most. So looking at the diagrams, we looked at certain areas that would get extreme sun at certain times, whereas the other areas would not be getting, and making sure, sure that the sunshade basically represented that analysis. That led us to all the different types of facade uh, and sh uh, shading types. So on the western facade, we had the mechanical zone, which was just a sh uh, shade with no glass. And on the other side, we had the, uh, the atrium. And the whole idea of the atrium is to have that daylight coming in at the same time, open up the views to create the space that we were looking for, and that gave us uh, a shallow shade with, with the glass uh, in there. The north and south corners, which had all the mechanical zones, didn't really need, it, need all those glass, so we had to cover them up with a clo uh, closed shade. And then, of course, the write-up areas, which is where the researcher, who was a key person using the space, we made sure we had the shade in there in the right depth to make sure that the glass and the shade gave that uh, protection against the daylight as well as glare. 
again, as I said, working within uh, prefabricated modules and making sure that the scale of the, the triangulated diagrid was essentially fabricated in terms of a, of a human scale. We had to also look at it in terms of making sure that the high performance double glaze uh, panels would meet the uh, solar requirements. And one of the key things that we had to work as a, as a SAMRI, uh, aspiration from SAMRI was to go in for a lead gold rating, which is a international environmental uh, and, uh, rating that the building has. And we, we've just achieved that a year ago. These are some of the images uh, of the building, and a lot of times when, when Samri is a great building to photograph because it, it just changes. There's no one front elevation or a side elevation. It's just an organic form that just changes as, as you go along. And the key thing that we've realized after the building was sort of in, in process was the, the, the play of sun and light. And that is something that changes throughout the day, that the triangulated facade just hits onto these sort of curved walls that we've got inside, and it and some of the walls are sort of curved, some of them are and glass, some of them are just solid panels, but the it just changes throughout the whole whole uh, day, and I think the best way to actually see it is through a, 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 a small movie that we've got, which uh, will probably give you an idea as to how the sun uh, and the shade sort of works throughout the whole building. So getting back to our initial question that we asked ourselves at the start of the project, can functional architecture and creative, sorry, functional lab design and creative architecture coexist? At Woods Packet, we believe it can. Thank you. Well, I sort of feel all sort of dreamy and floaty. <laughs> Even though there was a fantastic lot of um, facts, figures, and um, uh, development ideas there for us too. Thanks so much, Anoop. Has, has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask? Okay, I'll just grab one of these mics. So um, I just absolutely love that building in South Australia. Thank you. And I was just, it does really stand out and it just gives um, a um, sense of hope for the future for even more architecture. 
Um, but I was just wondering, did it did it take a lot of guts to put a form like that in our city? Because it feels it like there hasn't been a lot of... Yeah, I think uh, we started this project, as I said, five years ago when uh, this the whole funding that we got for this project was from the federal government. The first scheme that we put was an orthogonal box. And one of the key things that we got as a feedback from from the client, so SAMRI was still not formed at that time, but they were in the process of putting together a, 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 as, a, as a whole organization. One of the first feedback we got was that we shouldn't be turning our back to any part of the city because I think the great thing was the SAMRI came in uh, with, a, with, a, with a very high vision. They had this aspiration of being a thing of the world in Adelaide and that was key for us to say, okay, it's not just looking at it from a purely from an Adelaide point of view, they were looking at it global. The whole idea was that SAMRI wanted to be this uh, sort of headquarters for research and they wanted to attract researchers from all over the world, not just South Australia or you know, from Australia. So the whole aspiration was a lot more global than just uh, you know, a local one. And coming, from, coming with that sort of brief, we had to really look beyond than just the orthogonal box on the site and we, we had to basically test ourselves as much. And that was the whole thing with this, one of the visions that we talked about, you know, that became our sort of guiding sort of book. We kept looking at it every time that the, the, the thing that we had to put in there was something that would be completely what Samri's vision said. So that was the key thing in trying to push that boundary. And Samri is all about innovation, research. And when the researchers basically are telling you that you know, you've got to push the boundaries, I think we had to respond to that. Tremendous building. Uh, question on the gold lead aspect of it. Uh, actually, two questions. One, uh, how did that drive cost? Uh, how much did it increase it, so to speak? What sort of things did you have to do? Uh, and then would it have been possible to, to have achieved platinum even? Yeah, I mean, we, we looked at it uh, initially in terms of lead. And the, again, as I said, the whole aspiration was to have this global uh, if, uh, sort of rating that we were going for. Uh, platinum was fairly onerous in terms of having a lot more... Uh, things put onto the building to actually make it work, whereas the whole idea from Samri was they didn't want to buy an award. They wanted basically us to push the boundaries so that what we were working to try and get it as efficient as possible, looking at it completely from an environmental point of view, and not, not trying to say, okay, we're gonna tick this box and we'll put in 10 or 100 solar panels or something like that. That, that wasn't their whole idea. They wanted us to actually sweat the design to make sure whatever decisions we took, A, met the brief, and the cost plan was something that was set. There was no money other than this. And what happened with the whole project was those weekly meetings, just making sure that the cost plan was hit every time. And any time it went above, we had to look at other things that we could you know, pull and push it to make it work because we were told that that is it. There is no other money coming in. So it was five years, and again, as I said, work. this couldn't have been happening possible with just us drawing something on a piece of paper and giving it to the builder. It was a completely collaborative effort. So from everyone, from the design team, to the client, to the cons contractors, to even the subcontractors working on the site, everyone took that ownership on themselves to say, this is something we are doing which would probably, you know, in a small way, bring a, a relief or a research or a cure for some illness that would affect anyone from our, you know, from family or friends. And that, I think, took a, a larger meaning than just going for a nine to five job of getting something done. I think pushing all of those teams together, I think we managed to get a product that was something that, you know, we are all immensely proud of. Thanks. Probably got time for one more question, I reckon. How many people were on the design team and how long did you spend in the design team before you came up with the final product? And then how many people do you think were involved all together counting the architects and builders? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I said the design team. Yeah, I think uh, the, the design was, again, as I said, as part of this federal funding, the, f the money came in from the, the feds and they, were, they had certain milestones that we had to meet. So it, isn't that, it wasn't that we could sort of continue working on the design while you know, it went on. Also, in terms of the site, we got the site in pieces because, as I said, before we actually got the site, it was a, a rail yard. So there was a lot of work being done of removing all the rail yards and clearing the site. So we got the site in pieces. So we got it in five chunks. So we couldn't really have the site all in one go for the contractor to start. And it all went through a series of packages. Uh, at its peak, I think we were about 
35 to 40 people working on the design, which is the whole of our Adelaide office. Uh, and that was the peak because, again, it was all procured in packages. So we had an early works and then the structure, then the services and things. So, and as a, as a team, I think, uh, I don't know, I think it's probably hundreds of people who worked on it uh, who've probably done really, really well in terms of getting it all together. And it, it went uh, up and down. Well, just um, thanks again, Anoop, for a really inspiring presentation and an absolutely incredible example of collaboration and a huge amount of people buying into an idea and making a very beautiful thing. Thank you very much.